Welcome to the Andy Social Podcast. My name is Andy Dowling, bass player for the Australian metal band Lord, and also the host of the Self Starter Podcast. If you're into small business, freelancing, or self employment in general, you can go over to selfstarter.com.au or search for Self Starter in your preferred podcast player app or whatever. Um, you can go over there and, and give it a go. Um, and if you're into Lord, um, or you want to check out Lord, I should say, you can go to lord.net.au and give it a shot if you're into a bit of 80s heavy metal or actually. Not quite just 80s heavy metal. What I like, actually, hang on, let me take a step back. I always say to people, it sounds like Iron Maiden, Halloween, Queensryche, and a nice blend of Symphony X. That usually represents us fairly well. So go over there. I, actually, a little bit of John Farnham. I'll throw that in there, guys. <laughs> anyway, moving along, lord.net.au. Go and check that out. So uh, before we kick into this week's episode, as always for every episode of 2018, I'm doing shout outs, some thank yous to people that support this podcast and do great things for me. It can be anything. It can be a nice message that people send me. It can be tagging a mate in a post on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter or whatever it might be. It might be sharing some content, it might be leaving a review on Facebook or on iTunes or on somewhere else on the internet. It might be shouting me a beer via andysocial.net or buying merch from andysocial.net as well. Whatever it is, thank you. And I'm trying as the year progresses to give a little bit back and put it on public record to say thank you. And if you contact me, you hear me do a shout out for you, um, shoot me your details. I'm going to send something out to you. So this week's shout out, this week's thank you is international. It's Giampaolo de Montes. I'm horrible with names, guys. Giampaolo from Italy. Giampaolo has been following me for a little while now. He used to listen to my morning crazy talk with Andy YouTube podcasts, which were, well, it was dribble. It was absolute dribble. Every morning I would do a half hour to an hour rant or dribble about God knows what. And uh, Jim Paolo was one of the few people that would listen to uh, my daily ramblings. And um, and as a result, um, went in and discovered Lord, discovered the Antisocial Podcast, and he just supported me in a number of different ways um, over the last uh, probably couple of years. So a massive thank you. Thank you so much to Jim Paolo for um, all of your support. It means a hell of a lot to me. Shoot me a message um, and I'm going to send something out to you. I don't know what it is, but I've got some crap lying around the house. I'm sure I'll find something interesting. A little surprise in the post. Why not? So this week's guest, this is somebody that's been on my list for a while and not that he's elusive. If anything, he would have said yes to the very first uh, episode of the Andy Social Podcast, but I held out. I held out. There's a lot of people that I could have on straight away, but I've just been trying to just, I don't know, give give some time. I want this podcast to become bigger and better and then get some some of these guys on. But this is somebody that the time's come. It's it's time to have a good chat and, and get it on public record. But it's Chris Pachenko from Vanishing Point. And I've known Chris for quite a few years. We've played a bunch of shows together um, and Chris uh, and Vanishing Point um, – Vanishing Point in general is a band that I've looked up to for quite a number of years. Chris is a little bit older than me, not terribly older, but he's a little bit older. And as I was a, a young, impressionable teenager, uh, Vanishing Point was one of those bands that I discovered when I was discovering music here in Australia and, um, you know, Tangled in Dream in particular, their album from, I believe, 2000 um, was a really special album for me. It was a defining album for me as I was going through a number of different changes in my life and just finding out where I sit in the world. And, and I gush and carry on in this episode, so I'll, I won't carry on too much longer. But, you know, this Vanishing Point was one of those bands. And then over the years, as I became friends with Chris and Silvio and the guys, um, it's just been a real treat to be able to call these guys friends. And when we cross paths uh, in travels or we, we end up playing the odd show together, it's, it's really, really cool. And the last time we played together was actually Prog Power USA in 2016. And uh, we talk about that at, uh, towards the end of this episode. And I'll, I'll leave it all for that because um, it was a really special moment for both of us. And we, we reflect a bit on, on that. It was really, really cool to hear Chris's uh, Chris's experience from it, and it was it was shared from my end as well. So really, really cool to to hear from that. So um, I'm going to stop crapping on, as you guys are well and truly used to by now. Um, lots of great chats, um, lots of great insights, um, really cool stories from Chris, and uh, I'm going to let him take over from now. So please enjoy this episode with Chris Pachenko from Vanishing Point. G'day, mate. How are you? Very well. How are you? 
<laughs> yeah, not too bad, man, not too bad. I thought it's raining outside now. I can't get much done outside, so I thought, oh, well, why not do the interview now? <laughs> I'll get some more work done later on. There you go. You're you're uh, you're, pro- you're productive and uh, time efficient. So good on you. I'm trying my best. <laughs> 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 as news, as things with you. Yeah, good. Yeah, good. Yeah, keeping busy. Always something going on. I'm sure the same. I for see. You. I see. Yeah, yeah fantastic. <laughs> good stuff. Well, before we kick into this, go for it. There's one thing that I've been trying to work on with this podcast. So I'm trying to get better at it. Not yep. quite there yet, but it's all about how to start this podcast. How to make the guest, being you in this instance, feel as comfortable as possible be uh, excited and enthusiastic to have a good conversation because obviously if you're feeling comfortable, then I'm feeling comfortable. And then the, li- and the listeners are obviously enjoying the conversation as well. So sure. with that in mind, Chris, can you explain to me and everyone listening your relationship with Coriander? It's a fucking hate relationship. <laughs> <laughs> I hate it. It, it's, it. It tastes like soap. It smells like shit. It's utter, utter rubbish. No, honest truth is, um, actually stemmed from the prog power scenario. So, you know, when we got back from prog power and all that, I was just like, you know, posting random crap on Facebook as you do from time to time. You know, when you have a cigarette or a coffee or whatever, you just go, okay, yeah, what do I hate today? You fuck coriander. Fuck it. <laughs> and uh, all of a sudden, all the guys from America, all the people from America, especially the prog power crowd, um, went berserk because they love cilantro, which is coriander. He bit cil- they call it cilantro over yeah. there. Um, so they went berserk, and I was just like, "Holy shit!" <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm thinking, you know, if there's ever a time the vanishing point gets a chance to go back to prog power, I'm actually going to come up with an anti cilantro shirt for prog power <laughs> with the vanishing point logo in green and the moniker at the back is going to be the logo is going to be cilantro is not prog <laughs> <laughs> and i just and i briefly mentioned it on facebook and all these people have said fucking take my money <laughs> <laughs> who would have thought it would make you money there you go <laughs> well there you go there's always ways i suppose but um look it's like most things on Facebook that I post, I, I, I look, I, I take the piss out of things. You know what I mean? Facebook to me is like a really cool tool for, um, you know, communicating with people and expressing your thoughts and getting involved in conversation and discussion, you know, and, and, you know, here and there. But for me, it's also a bit of a departure from reality and, you know, have a laugh, take the piss out of myself, take the piss out of things. A lot of people in the scene who know me know that, you know, I take things seriously, but at the same time, too, I like to have a good, you know, hearty laugh, and that's why I approach life. Yeah, for sure. Oh, well, there you go. How about that for setting the tone of the conversation? Well, there you go. There you go. <laughs> I thought either, either you're going to start... Coriander. Yeah, that's right. I thought either you're going to start raging, or it might go the other way. So, I was very... <laughs> well, if I start raging, I'll probably smash my mobile phone. I just got the, <laughs> the screen replaced, and therefore, we couldn't conduct the interview, because it'd be bonkers. Oh, but I, it's all good, man. I, I, just, I just finished it there and put the... In- put the episode up just like that so <laughs> i think that'd be good enough <laughs> words of wisdom with pachanko <laughs> yeah, that's it that's it <laughs> oh shit well well i've got heaps of things to talk about because I, and i'm going to try and keep it in a bit of a timeline because sure. i've jotted down a whole bunch of notes and there's little nuances and things along the way that i thought oh that's that'd be really interesting to ask you so i'll try and keep it in a bit of a chronological order but i'll probably end up in my own fashion going off on tangents and going all over the place. Same here, man. Yeah. Not a problem at all. So we'll just uh, we'll just see where it leads us. But is this year your 20th year in Vanishing Point? Uh, correction, actually. Last year was my 20th year in ah, Vanishing Point. So, so it's 97. So, yeah, that's correct. So I joined Vanishing Point in September 97. Um, it just it, it happened just by chance, basically. Um, one of the guys I used to jam with, Pep San Martino, who was actually instrumental with myself and the guys writing uh, the Tangling Dream album, he actually joined the band just previously before that. And Pep and I used to be in a band called Mindscape, slash, we changed our name to Mindstate. It was like a progressive metal band in Melbourne. Um, then what had happened was, you know, th- th- that band had split up and... I actually went off and just did acoustic stuff for a while. I was heavily into Tea Party for a while, so I didn't touch the, the, the electric guitar for about a year to two years. And um, I did some, you know, um, duo playing with another guy, another gentleman by the name of Bray. We are doing, like, you know, um, guitar playing, acoustic guitar playing for, like, you know, dance groups and stuff like that, which was a little bit different, but it was something refreshing at the time. And 
I was talking to Pep after a while and I thought, okay, we'll you know, get back to songwriting, whatever, because Pep's an amazing songwriter. And he said to me, actually, Vanishing Point haven't had their guitarist turn up for about three and a half, four weeks, and nobody knows where he's gone, whatever. You know, and there was Andrew, and obviously maybe Andrew had a turn of his life back then and you know, decided it probably wasn't for him. So he said, why don't you give Silver a call? So the story is I gave Silver a call and um, said, look, you know, if things don't work out with Andrew, um, I'm looking for a band. Um, and I just like briefly knew Silvio through the scene by that stage as well um, because Vanishing Point, when they were called I, supported Mindscape um, at, you know, what's now Max was back then was called the Wall Street or the Hi-Fi Bar or whatever. Yeah. And um, Silvio goes, cool, man, no worries, and leave it with me. Um, so I'm like, okay, cool. You know, if I hear from him, fantastic. If I don't, hey, no problem. He rings back half an hour and he says, look, you know, we've got rehearsal tonight. Bring down your gear. And it was just as simple as that. I'm like, okay, no worries. So I um, brought down my gear. By that stage, my car didn't have reverse. It was a Ford XD wagon. It was a piece of shit. Um, the only way you could get into the back of the, into the car was through the back tailgate because all the XD door handles were broken, as you know, many people who have had Fords <laughs> know what they're like. And um, I brought my two quad, uh, quad boxes, my guitars and my rack and all that, and started jamming and then you know and the rest is history as i say more or less so one question around that time is because i think they'd already put out in thought at that stage the first that's correct of yes yeah and then the following year they re-released it again but you, that's correct but you recorded guitars on the re-released version that's correct and was yeah it just so the guitars or was it or did they do a whole new re- re-recording <sighs> No, it was actually just the guitars and the song in a piece, um, which we had recorded. And basically, that was the first song I wrote with the band. And that went on that In Thought re release, which was back then through a label in Germany called um, Angular Records, which was a small label. Um, and then that was in 98 or 99 by memory. And mm-hmm. then in 2000, I think it was, um, or 2001, Tangled in Dream had come out. So. Mm. Yeah, Entangled and Dream was actually my first full album with the band. Full album. Um, yeah. Yeah, cool. And so was there a particular reason as to why, like obviously there was a, I'm, I'm assuming that there was a, a deal that warranted re-releasing In Thought again the following year, but given that there was the, the guitars and everything were tracked and there was, there was already a recording that existed, was it more of a case mm. that they just wanted you involved and wanted you to be a part of it, so that's why they put the guitars in place for, for you for that re-release, or was there another reason as to why that they wanted to do that at the time? I think it was a culmination of many factors. Basically, they wanted me to be you know, included in, uh, as such, um, so basically we had photo shoots and all that. Um, at the same time, too, what had happened was with Angular Records, um, they decided to shut up shop. Um, basically, it was just before the whole um, internet downloading thing happened, whatever. The guy, um, Stefan, um, nice guy, um, but he was doing that as a part-time thing, that label. And he said, look, I can't see myself surviving doing this. So you guys are free to go. And basically, we had like a word of mouth licensing deal, I think, through our previous management at that stage. And then, um, you know, the, the album came out. But it's like, you know, the, the response worldwide, I think, in Europe and America was okay, but lukewarm. Uh, it wasn't as it wasn't until Tangled and Dream kicked in that things started happening for us, more or less. But um, in thought at that stage, I should did quite well in Australia with Australian sales at that stage. So, yeah, it was not, not too bad. Oh, it's still, it's still one of those albums where if anybody's talking about sort of melodic metal or even even crossing into sort of melodic rock kind of stuff that um, yep. that, that album seems to be in conversation. Obviously, Tangled in Dreams, like, up there, and that's one, and I'll get to that in a moment, but, yep. you know, In Thought seems to be, it's it's the OG, it's the it's the original gangster of, of, of Vanishing Point. And, <laughs> and, and I've looked online, I mean, especially that first pressing, the early, earliest yes. one, I mean, geez, they, they're gone for a bit. I mean, there's not too many of them around now, but um, I've seen a few yeah. going online and being sold through sort of ebay and and discogs and all that sort of stuff and go oh geez like uh, they're they're a little bit sought after yeah they are i mean you're fine with the cd buying community especially that the progressive people and the people in the melodic metal they're very um particular as to what they buy in terms of pressings and all that so basically if they like an album they will want to get whatever pressings there are and if there's like an earlier pressing that's like hard to come by they will pay the dollars for it 
personally speaking, I think it's crazy. But at the same time, too, you know, if that's what they want to do, then fantastic. Um, geez, if I had a whole lot of CDs spare, I'd probably chuck them up on eBay as well and make some <laughs> coin out of it. <laughs> but um, I wouldn't charge even half the price what the people are charging, of course. But look, with In Thought, going back to the band, how it was, that was so pretty much like a chapter of the band as it was at that stage you know i mean the guys just like learning their craft more or less before i joined the band and um it was like a chapter where the where the band was how could you say stylistically within that time you know what i mean like mm-hmm. the guys before i joined the band they were heavily into bands like say for example paradise lost and all that mm-hmm. and so that reflected you know what i mean on on in thought in a sense because there wasn't really any fast-paced songs it was a lot more you know slow to mid-range mid-paced songs yeah. Um, and I was like, hey, this is cool and stuff like that. But then as we started, you know, rehearsing more and more, you know, we went to the next album and that things got a little bit more serious by then. So what, what were your influences that you brought in? What, what are the things that they didn't have that you had? So your background, what things that sort of got you excited about, you know, from a musical point of view? Well, you know, when I, when I started listening to metal, when I grew up, um, for me, it was – you know, of course, Scorpions and, you know, Queensryche, Iron Maiden and all that. And then, you know, in, you know, I think it was the mid-90s, of course, it was Dream Theater. Not that I can play any Dream Theater stuff, but I loved <laughs> what was going on. You know yeah. what I mean? It was technical, but it made sense. That's with the earlier stuff for me. Mm-hmm. Um So when I joined the band, you know, I think one of the concerns when I joined the band was, okay, here comes Chris is from a, you know, technical progressive middle band like Mindscape. Uh, which was actually quite proggy at that time. And, you know, it wasn't like we're doing 4-4 beats. It was just the drums and the, the rhythms were all over the place. It was like a hard rock version of Watchtower or some shit at that stage. <laughs> um, but with that being said, you know, the guys were probably concerned that I was going to over, te- you know, uh, do things too technical. And I expressed my opinion back then. I said, look, I don't want to do really anything technical. I just want to do songs. Yeah. I just want to write songs, good songs with people that are driven, uh, try to write good music and get along and see where it, you know, takes us, you know. And, and they said to me, now, are you interested in going to Europe and all that? And I said, sure, I've got my passport ready. <laughs> and, and that was it. It's, um, I mean, obviously, you know, considering what's happened since then, it's it's worked out mm. right? For, as far as you gelling in with the band. And, and now I'm, I'm assuming that, and I don't know this for sure, but I'm assuming you're pretty much the primary songwriter for the most part. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's pretty much come to a stage where, look, I've got quite a bit of money invested in my equipment at home. Um, it's also a time thing with some of the guys that don't have time. I'm proficient in the sense that I write a lot of music. Mm. Um, I, I just can't help it, you know what I mean? It, it's something that I have within me, you know. Other people do sport and stuff like that. I do music, I write music, and I enjoy that. And um, so there's never a shortage of ideas. Like, it's not like I'm writing 30, 40 songs for an album, but... You know, whenever there's an album done, there's always three or four songs overlaid that's left over or firm ideas that could be put to the next album or could be put towards bonus tracks, whatever. So ever since, pretty much since the guy, a lot of the guys left in 2010, um, I've been really, well, this is the son I wrote the album by myself, but when I joined Vanishing Point back in the time when we did Tangle and Dream, I was really pushing the band back then to up the ante more or less and I suppose some of my AOR and prog influences probably came into the the picture then you know um i've always looked upon you know being in a band as being something there where everybody can work together and create something together and we did for a long time especially before tangling dream we were, we were renting a, a warehouse space and back then we were paying like 150 bucks a week or something like that and we had that what warehouse space yeah it was great because we had our pa and everything and all the gear set up and uh, we didn't have heating, so candles were burning in wintertime, whatever. <laughs> and uh, in summer, we sweated like pigs, but that's the way it was. But we actually wrote Tangled in Dream in that band setting, and we were rehearsing three times a week. Uh, pretty hardcore, which was great, you know, back then. Looking upon it, it was, there were some frustrating times as well, but it was um, it was exciting. Do you have photos of that old warehouse space and you guys rehearsing and playing in there no i don't because back then we didn't even have digital cameras man yeah i was gonna say <laughs> it was that old just shows you my age i'm ancient <laughs> just, no but it, it was look it was dingy man i mean you yeah. know you went to the bathroom there was no light in there so 
you know, you know, it, it was it was pretty crappy, but it served its purpose and it had a really cool atmosphere to it. Uh, it was dirty and disgusting, um, but you could crank up the music and play as loud as you wanted. We could play as long as we wanted. Um, there were times where I would go out to the cat house on a Saturday night and. You know, I'd be bored and going, well, instead of going home, I'd drive up from St Kilda to Brunswick and, you know, just crank up the amp and come up with a whole lot of riffs and record them in a little tape player and show them to the guys, you know, seven hours later when they come to rehearsal. And that was a regular thing as well. That's cool. I mean, I'm, I'm big on, you know, having having a space for creativity and just having some somewhere that, um, you know, you can you can plug and play. And it just yep. it just encourages so much from a creative and even a productive point of view and even as as you said like you know the place um, and i'm trying to visualize it in my head like this dingy place you know there's no light in the in the toilet it's just this yeah. it's no frills there's nothing to it but it's it's your it's your spot it's your little place it's a sanctuary that you go into and the yeah. fact that you've got limited distractions there and it's very basic that's probably actually helped remove the distractions and keep you guys focused as to what you want to achieve well, that was the good thing about it. And it sounds weird, but in that room, the mobile phone coverage back then was terrible. <laughs> um, so when you're recording and when you're, or when you're coming up with riffs and all that, the only noise you would hear was actually from the other bandmates. Or when you're sitting down having a chat, especially when it was early in the morning, you'd hear, you'd hear across the, the street the meat truck pull up and you know the the carcasses of whatever it was on the hooks would be rolling down the little conveyor belt into the meat processing yard which was really bizarre and weird and <laughs> scary and macabre at the same time but those were the, really the only um uh how could you say distractions the only other distraction was trying to get out of the, the rehearsal space because sometimes you'd have a meat truck which would be blocking the drive the driveway <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's safe to say that uh swinging carcasses and a meat truck were were big influences behind uh tangled in dream totally you can you can see it's, you can hear it subliminally in the title tangled in dream equals pig carcasses and beef <laughs> on, on meat hooks. Totally, totally, yeah. I love it. I love Carcass it. stole the idea from us. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> if only you had digital cameras, if only. <laughs> Absolutely, man. But the thing is, I think that if people saw the rehearsal space that we were, you know, rehearsing in back then, if we had digital, you know, photos of it, man, it, it's amazing how much is held by gaffer tape. <laughs> <laughs> like the floor was held by gaffer tape. Some of the parts of the ceiling were held by gaffer tape. Yeah, it was pretty much a gaffer tape room, you know what I mean? It, it stunk like gaffer tape, probably stale piss, not from us, but, you know, from previous bands or whatever, or just, you know, there was probably mould in there that which, which, which we didn't know about, and sometimes we got sick, but it was a good creative space to create the music for back then, you know what I mean? It was pretty much walk in and play the guitars and everything with there. Luckily, we had a security system there as well, so we just punch in the password and unlock the door and tune up the guitars and off we go, you know? And there was a, even, even if, and if the rehearsal went really late or some of us just didn't feel like driving home that night, there was a catch we could crash out on, crash out on as well. So it served its purpose. It was pretty good. I think um, just what you said before about, you know, not not having the cameras there and not and people not actually seeing the reality behind it all and i was going to ask you this later on anyway but i'll, I'll get to it now that Go whole mis mystery versus the transparency of what music is now like so you yep. know our heroes from like the 70s and the 80s these great amazing musicians that we've idolized over the years especially growing up and yep. there there was this untouchable aspect to them they were bigger than life and 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 you didn't see much behind the scenes only when they released a vhs and it had a little bit of back behind the scenes or it popped up in a video clip somewhere and you're like oh that looks really cool but you never yeah. you never saw much of that and they were so untouchable and in some ways it was really cool but in other mm. ways and i guess the advantages that we have now is that we're so interactive with the people that love our music and so that mm. the connection's really strong but um mm. i mean where do you sit with that do you believe that like with at that time of tangled in dream if people saw what you guys were rehearsing in and working on your music in that it may have taken some of that magic away of the perception of what the album was obviously the music speaks for itself but you know, mm. visually there's obviously some influence there as well that's a hard question to answer but yeah. with that being said i think that at that time the lack of interaction socially was probably good because it, it, it enabled us to just 
basically focus on creating music and not listening to too many outside influences or outside distractions. Mm. Um, and, you know, these days you have, like with a lot of bands, they're posting their new songs or new ideas online, which I think is great. I love that stuff because I love to hear what other bands are doing. But at the same time, too, it, it, as you said, it takes away that little bit of mystique, mm. you know, of what they're creating. And sometimes you have, like, your keyboard warriors online saying, oh, that sounds good, but it doesn't sound like you love them. Like, like what Gurgitator <laughs> said years ago, I love your old stuff better than your new yeah. stuff and all that shit. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it takes away that and you get your keyboard warriors, you know, saying, oh, I wish it was like that. And then before a band, like, gets in the studio to properly record it, they've already... They're really biased, you know, mm. with opinions. Whereas beforehand with Tangled in Dream, it was like, we're just going to do what we do. And pretty much with Vanishing Point, it's always, gonna be, it's always been a case that we would just do what we would do. But more or less back then, because of the lack of the interaction socially on all your media platforms, etc., there was that whole, we're just doing our music and when we were ready to record it, we're going to record it and that's it. Mm. We didn't think about how's it going to be marketed we, we didn't know about anything like that i mean probably to agree sometimes even today we still are probably you know uh, how could you say green-eyed with all that you know what i mean but more or less back then it was the whole yeah just go for it just do it and if people like it cool because we like it and if they don't hey that's all right too you know we'll play a few gigs and see how it goes and that's all it was you know and well, yeah the, the the whole social media thing is good and I like it, but at the same time, too, I think it's like open sometimes the floodgates to too many people trying to create something for the, the purpose of trying to remain current or some bullshit. And yeah. I just don't believe in that, you know? Yeah, I think you're forever chasing your tail. And I think in, in the end, you and your quality of work just diminishes significantly because you're too fixated on what the outside noise is and yeah. seeing what your peers are doing and going, oh, shit, I need to... I need, to, I need to start wearing masks or I need to start like wearing yeah. uniforms on stage or I need to, you know, something something that can be so trivial and it just distracts yeah. you away from just being genuine and actually putting putting in you know, the love of what you've got into, into your craft. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, I think that, you know, it's come to the stage where now there, there, there is so much saturation in the metal scene too that, or in, in any music scene, uh, there's so much going on that it's just like, uh, uh, how could you say it's just like an information overload yeah. you know what I mean and it's hard to sometimes distinguish which bands you'd be really interested in because everybody's going oh man you got to check out this band you're just like oh fuck just give me a break you know <laughs> especially when I'm when I'm writing music or recording stuff I I, I, I People say to me, oh, what do you listen to? I say, I don't, I'm not listening to anything. <laughs> I'm only listening to my own stuff. It's not an arrogant thing, but I, I'm only listening to my own stuff. I'm not purposely putting on any other CDs because I'm just trying to focus on what I do. Because if I get influenced by other stuff, you know, I mean, it's out there and, you know, hey, there's some awesome stuff out there, then as you said, you'd be forever chasing your tail and you'd never be happy with what you've created. You know what I mean? You'll always be um, trying to compete or uh, challenging yourself to the point of, you know, stupidity. And the other, the other thing that's a little bit separate to this, but it's still that you know, it. the the, mis the mystery versus you know being so transparent these days. It's like when I was growing up, and I would look at you know these these metal and rock heroes. For me, mm -hmm. that was and seeing the mystery behind it was an escape from me from you know my day to day grind or whatever I was doing, whatever issues mm -hmm. I had, you know, going through school or you know starting to work and all that kind of stuff. But mm -hmm. then watching you know, VHS or going to a show or just listening to music and being immersed in it and not knowing so much of what was happening behind the scenes, not seeing the candid photos and all that kind of stuff, only glimpses of it mm. here and there. Um, mm. it, there was this world of mystery around it and it sort of just gave me this opportunity to escape from whatever I was swept up in at that point in time in my life. And mm. so I miss a bit of that and I, and I try and force myself to go down that path and, and try and recapture that with some bands where I just deliberately don't go and watch a lot of behind the scenes stuff or I don't really follow mm. them too much on social media because I don't want to see a lot of that stuff and not because it's bad, but I think it's just for me, I, I love, I love the fantasy aspect of some bands where I just think that they're larger than life and they're these incredible people and they're, they're not like you and me, they're, 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 yep. they're from another planet and they're, they're absolutely incredible. And I don't know. I mean, I appreciate the other side of it. And I think we've, I mean, from our end, we've done really well with going in the opposite direction of being really transparent. And we, we, we pride ourselves on being DIY and being very, mm. there's no middleman. We're totally connected with the people that support us. You know, they're pretty much our friends. Um, and yep. we've really sort of brought them in and they're like the fifth, sixth, 
one thousandth member of the band, and that's yeah. how, and that and that works really well. But it's finding that balance between the two, and it's really really difficult because yeah, I, I don't know whether I'm I'm clinging onto the past ever so desperately, or whether um, whether there's there's something to consider about uh, where we've come from. You know, it's it, it, it's it's that's an interesting point. I cling to the past to a degree as well. Um, I love the nostalgia. You know what I mean? And for me. I've never, I suppose it worked in the sense that I'd never really bought into much of the Scorpion stuff, for example. Scorpion's been one of my number one hard rock bands of all time. Mm, um, when the Blackout album came out, that was like what got me into metal and still probably my number one or in my top five albums of all time. But I've never really, so you know, subscribed to the whole Scorpions online stuff. Mm. And that's the band to me that within the, the, the portals of the, the whole social media and the internet, whatever, they still have a little bit of nostalgia. So for me, when I saw them live um, back in 2016, my wife, Simone, and myself, we went and saw them at the Palais Theatre in Melbourne. And, man, it was awesome. That whole nostalgic feeling was there. You know what I mean? Singing along to all the songs that they created, whatever. You know, and it was just... Here's a band that hasn't really been involved in any like social media scandals or haven't hasn't really expressed their opinion on politics and all that bullshit. They're just getting out there and playing rock and roll and playing the classics that people want to hear. And you know, it's probably showing my age group as well. But I loved seeing that. I loved um, just witnessing that live. And my wife and I were standing. We're just like, oh man, this this is awesome, you know. And, and it made me feel young again. You know, what I mean, I'm not old, but I mean, it made me feel younger again. You know, and and that's what I like. You know, the older stuff. Um, I love that nostalgia. I think that you know, in this day and age, though, with the internet, whatever, whatever band can do to get its music out there, I think you know, do it wise, but still keep the focus on the music. You know, and don't keep the focus on, you know, your politics and all that, because all of us, we, we can have a rant about politics. But at the end of the day, you know, and I think I put a post on Facebook probably about a year ago or something like that, and I said, look, if you've got time to post about politics every day on Facebook, perhaps maybe go into fucking politics, because <laughs> this is not the place to always be rambling on about the same old bullshit, yeah. you know what I mean? Because a lot of people, like especially my friends are on Facebook, we like to have a laugh, but we're there for the music. You know what I mean? I'm there to also check in, you know, interest in new bands, check out old bands, but also I'm on Facebook as well because I actually man the Vanishing Point page. So if somebody, you know, contacts Vanishing Point for a show or whatever, I'm the, I'm the guy that deals with them, you know, and that's why I'm there. But, yeah. you know, nostalgia is good. I like nostalgia, man. You yeah, know? me too. Me too. And I think, I think, um, I think the big thing is that if you can find a blend between the boat, between the two, so you're not stuck in the past and refusing mm. to, to move with the times, but you know, you're embracing what's happening now and, you know, you give, you give people a glimpse into what you know what day-to-day -day life might be for the band and some of the behind the scenes stuff and that's really good but then also having elements of mystique around around the band itself as well and i think then you've you've probably got the best of both worlds but it's you know it's a fine yeah, line look, it's really hard it's it's acknowledging the past but also embracing the future but also understanding that you know with a lot of musicians that are out there especially in today's climate you know what i mean they're not doing it full time you know what i mean mm -hmm. they, they all have you know uh, day jobs they all have responsibilities, they have families, etc. you know, and especially for a lot of bands and a lot of musicians, you know, uh, who live in Australia, who are Australian, you know, Australians, it's very hard to just go and do this all the time, to travel over to Europe to go into a tour or whatever, because we've got the whole distance factor and there's so much money involved and there's visas and all that type of stuff. And, you know, with what all us bands make, we don't make that kind of money that, you know, we can just pay for the flight tickets, no worries, pay for the visa applications and have, an, you know, a visa agent do that all for us, you know what I mean, to go and play like, you know, maybe 18 shows or something like that and come back not only broke but in negative. It's it's a hard call. So we all have to have day gigs in order to um, sustain what we do, more or less. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I hear you. I'm just, I mean... <laughs> I'm just thinking about today. Like I'm work I'm working from home today, so I'm I'm I'm, gotcha. multi I'm multitasking. But um, you know, it's 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 the reality of it all. I remember an interview with um, uh, I think it was Nevermore, and this is probably going back fifteen odd years ago. And 
I don't know who it was. It might have been Worrell or, or Jeff or something like that. And they just said, yeah, we've all got shit kicking day jobs. Like we've, you know, yeah. this is not, this is not a full-time gig. And for me at the time, I thought, you know, never more these gods. And I went, yeah, holy fuck. Like if, if they, ha- if never more have to have jobs, then what fucking yeah. hope do I have to, yeah. <laughs> to yeah. be in a band where I don't have to work anymore? And and over time, yeah, your your your, your perspective of of what you want out of music and what you want out of a band changes and matures mm. and gets better as as you learn more and you get more life experience. But at the time, I, my my world was slightly shattered then because I just thought, man, like these guys were were pretty far up the food chain in my opinion. Yeah. And so I just thought, oh wow, this is the realities of what what music really yeah. is. Yeah. In inverted commas, enemies of reality. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but but it, it, that that actually, I think at that stage too, for me, that was like fuck. You know, what I mean, knowing that these guys are like kitchen hands, they're chefs. I think one of them works for a gaming company as well and stuff mm. like that. But they all had their day jobs because, you know, playing live and, and touring nonstop, whatever, just didn't pay the bills, didn't pay the rent, you know. And when you've got a family where, you know, you've got a wife and kids, whatever, that, there's a harsh reality. You know, when you get married and you're, you're all of a sudden you're either paying rent or if you're lucky enough and fortunate enough to be in a position where you can put a deposit in the house and buy a house, you know, the bank's not just going to say, well, you know, yeah, go and do a tour and, and we'll sort out your repayments when you get back. <laughs> it's not like that, you know? No. And um, I, think, I think now with like the internet, it's, you know, a lot more integrated into day-to-day life for, for, for good or bad, depending on how you look yeah, at it. Yeah. Um, there's so many more musos out there now that are starting to, to become self-employed, they're finding their own initiative, trying to find ways to, and in the right way, making money through music. So, you know, you see a yeah. lot of bands doing like little afternoon workshops and, and um, you know, lessons with people prior to their shows on tour. They're doing like Skype lessons. They're doing all this other stuff that brings in money from other, other revenue streams. And, and now like people are understanding that it's not such a taboo and a, and a blasphemous thing to say about a band, but a band is a business and you can make money out of it. And so yeah. the, the smarter guys are, are really sort of mm. taking advantage of that. But, um, I think, you know, years gone by, you would sort of be shunned a little bit if you openly talked about, you know, your jobs and what you do, because it's like, oh, you're removing the mystique about your band. Like you're, yeah. you, know, yeah. you, don't, you know, you're just like the rest of us, you know, you're not that special after all. And it's like, well, we're not like, we just, yeah. we are literally the same as you. But I, I got it because I've, I've, I'm on that side of the fence as well. When I look at some of the, the greats from years gone by. So yep. it's um it's finding it's finding that balance because yeah you, we're in the end we're we're also entertainers and and we've got mm. to entertain people and give people an opportunity to escape and 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 have some sort of relief and and, and enjoyment and so you got to do that and if you if you too sort of I don't know if you're giving them a, a slap of reality um <laughs> from from your end as well then people might gravitate in another direction so you got to. There's that a, can happen as well. There's a fine line there, but um, always trying. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that it comes down to too is, um, you know, like when you're talking about the reality of the things too, it's, it is a sign of the times how you have bands that are on tour or whatever and, you know, some of the really good guitarists, really good drummers or bass players, etc., or, you know, the, the, the people who manage the bands, etc., or whatever, what have you, they're doing workshops in order to create an alternative income flow because mm-hmm. they have to because, you know, sometimes, you know, for example, if you're touring in Australia or if a band from overseas is touring in Australia, okay, you've got a thousand kilometres between Sydney and Melbourne. You know, you've got to pay for petrol money, you've got to pay for your roadies, you've got to pay for gear, high backline accommodation um, and, and food, you know, and all those type of things. So, you know, if they're doing Skype lessons or whatever or trying to, just like, you know, create a, an alternative income flow, that definitely helps, you know, the, 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 the long run for the band as well, you know. And the unfortunate thing is, you know, with some of these bands that are doing it on a semi-professional level, which is close to full-time, it's very difficult for them to hold down full-time positions because really no boss is going to say to you, yeah, okay, you can go on tour for three months or six months of the year, then come back and work for for me for two weeks and then, you know, off you go again. No boss is going to accept that. And and as as much as that sucks, that's the reality of the situation. I know being self-employed myself that, you know, if my business was to expand um, and I was to put on people, you know, as harsh as it sounds, you know what I mean? Uh, you know, I could probably put on musicians, whatever, and go, okay, they can work during the busy period and off they go away. But 
I know as a business person in the long run, you'd want somebody there permanent, you know what I mean? And that's that's the harsh reality because bills have to be paid at the end of the day, you know? And touring doesn't always necessarily pay the bills. And I think, unfortunately, and I think I think now, and I think we're I think a lot of people are getting better, or maybe it's just me getting better. It's probably just me, but <laughs> I think I, I'm I'm focusing more on the solution rather than the problem. So instead of me worrying about, and I've done this in the past, like you mm. know trying to apply for a job and then telling them up front, or do I tell them up front that I plan a band and I need time off, or do I just wait mm. and get the job and then and then break it to them and just cross my fingers, and always sort of blaming the job or blame the blaming mm. the manager or the boss the employer at as to them cramping my style or holding me back when it really yeah. i mean they've got their own agenda they've got their own priorities and and for me like i'm the one that's working for them and they're giving me money yeah. so there's a yeah. there's an agreement there and it's got nothing to do with the band and so yeah. then you start get going well once i've gotten over that hurdle and i can understand yeah. the concept then it's like well I need to start thinking creatively about what the solutions are. How can I get around this? How can I find yes. alternatives? How can I probably compromise in this area, but then mm. find something else to, to offset it and balance it out. And so, but a lot of people get so stuck in, you know, even just like, you know, going back to, you know, the whole reduction of people buying CDs these days and mm. online stuff and streaming. So, so many people are stuck in the past and they're stuck on the problem instead of going, well, that's, that's cool. I can't change it. I can't do much about it. So I'll stop complaining. And now I'm going to start seeing what I can do to really take advantage of the changes that are being made. And so it's just a, it's a mindset thing. And uh, I, I seem maybe it's just because I've changed over the years, but I see it more with people now that people are more focused on solutions rather than the problem. You know, Andy, and that's correct, you know, and, and I cannot argue with that whatsoever. I think that, you know, the way to look upon it, as much as I sound like a wanker saying it, but, you know, if you have a positive outlook, you're going to have the positive vibes coming back. Uh, for example, how you're talking about in terms of employment, you know what I mean? Like today, you're sitting at home working from home. Mm. Those are the other things that can be done too. I mean, of course, it doesn't apply to everybody with their, with their skill set and their jobs, but um, the whole nine to five day is gone in in some ways. Mm. You know what I mean? It's like you know, you make you, you, you manage your time, make time for what you do, um, and also you know keep your appointments ahead. Um, answer the phone when the phone rings. I know being self-employed, for example, you know, I mean, my number one motto is, and, and some of the guys said to me, how come you sometimes get so much work? I go, simple, I answer the phone. If I miss the phone call, I ring the person back. Yeah. That's it, because it could be either, uh, it could determine whether the week is a famine or it's a feast. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And being self-employed, it all balances that over, 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 the re over a financial year. But with that being said, that's the way it is. That's the reality of it. Working for myself now, that's how it goes. I was fortunate enough many years ago, I used to work for Holden. I used to work for General Motors Holden. I used to be a test driver for, at the Proving Ground in Lang Lang in Victoria. And just under 18 years, I was test driving cars, new cars, prototypes and all that. I was very lucky that out of those casual years, I got along really well with my management team there. And when I became full-time, they still understood that I, I go on tour or I go play gigs from time to time. I'm re recording an album from time to time, you know, and they've always said to me, look, just let us know a couple of months in advance, whatever. We'll work it out. We'll make sure you've got your annual leave, you know, that's owing whatever to cover you and your family and whatever you don't have, you know, you know, you can work it off, whatever, and we just won't pay for that week that, you know, you've run out of annual leave, but you're still away. That was really, I was really lucky to have that, you know what I mean? Whereas a lot of people don't have that, <laughs> you know what I mean? So... Look, I count my blessings, you know, but I think it comes down to that with anything you do, you've you got to make time. You've got to make time and you, you try to um, be as, how could you say, proactive as possible, you know, and like you said, find the solutions, you know, um, offer suggestions or ask people for suggestions, you know what I mean? Because at the end of the day, if you just go, oh, no, it's all too fucking hard, fuck it, then it does nothing, you know what I mean? It, it's, it, it just creates a whole... How could you say torrent of negativity? And I've been a victim of this myself. You know what I mean? Um, nobody's perfect. It creates a whole torrent of negativity, and then therefore, when you're trying to get back onto your feet and get back to that previous position you were there, it takes so much more energy to get there. And then by the time you arrive at the destination, you're tired. You know, what I mean, you're exhausted. So it's better to keep things flowing 
in an even on an even scale more or less and if you can move a little bit more forward that's a good thing you know it's but that, that's life in general man it's hard I you know think, uh, it, it, you can make it as easy as you want or you can make it as hard as you want you know yeah absolutely and i think i think uh, the more that you sort of think about even just going back to your scenario of working for gm and mm. building a relationship with your manager and your boss and them being able to come back to you and saying, yeah, okay, we'll support you because you support us. And yep. I think a lot of us, you know, at times sort of get, we fall into this trap where we expect things from other people without doing much from our end in the first place. We, we're, yes. we're, we're trying to, we're trying to take something first. We think we're entitled yeah. to something where, and mm. somebody else is obligated to give us something and we're not actually making an effort to go, well, what can I actually give this person? What can, what value can I give somebody else? And then hundred percent precisely, the man. Back. Yeah. Unfortunately, I think that in some cases we, society as a whole especially i don't know i'm, I'm going to probably ruffle some feathers here but there's a lot of people out there who suffer from um self-entitlement complexes mm. they believe that for fuck all input they should receive everything yeah. you know what i mean um for, for or little to no input then they they, they have the rights to a lot of things mm. um you know and that's a really harsh reality because when i was even for me to undertake right now because you know years ago when i was working for example at general motors holden you know what i mean you put into your work you know what I mean? you showed them that your loyalty and you, you the loyalty that i had with that company i was there for just on 18 years or just under 18 years that was a company that i was endeavoring to you know as my job to provide for my family i was endeavoring to stay with that company until i was in retirement age you know unfortunately it wasn't to be because the industry went to shit Mm. But with that being said, with the loyalty that I gave them, and I enjoyed my work, I enjoyed the team of people I, I worked with. It was a fantastic team, and I miss them still to this day. You know, it's nearly five years that I'm now working for myself, but I miss those people that I worked with. They were great people. It was the management team was fantastic. My supervisors were awesome. One of my supervisors used to be a metalhead as well. <laughs> we were a night shift, man. We'd be putting on the normal radio stations or whatever, like, you know, th uh, PBS, whatever, or 3 R or, or Hoagie when he was on um, Triple J. And, man, everything from, like, Queen's Right to Cannibal Corpse would be on the stereo in the workshop. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> it was fantastic, you know. So, I mean, with that being said, though, when you're going back to the whole entitlement complexes, I think that, you know, in, this is in my opinion. I think that, you know, people should realize that the more you put in, you know, you might get something out of it at the end of the day. Don't put in expecting some kind of return. If you get something back, fantastic. But put in because you want to. Do something because you want to. Don't do something because you're always expecting something from it. You know what I mean? Because otherwise, you're always going to be chasing your tail thinking, okay, yeah, I did an album. I, I was into this band for six months and then it got boring. So I just, you know, I went and got, did something else. And you, you're back at, you know, the start position again or you, you're back in negative territory. There's no point. That's probably why I've been with VP for so many years. There's been times where I thought, fuck it. I don't want to be in VP. I'll go start my own band. But then I think to myself, well, if I start an own, my own band or another band, whatever, I'm going to start with musicians I don't know or whatever. What's going to be the processes there, whatever. So better to be with what I know. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's, that, it's that, you know, the longevity aspect where you understand that not everything comes at once and not everything comes quickly. No. And part of, I mean... Oh, geez, we've definitely gone off on a tangent, but that's oh, all right, man. No, no, Let's no, just I fucking it. ride it. <laughs> but, but it's that whole, you know, you enjoy the journey rather than the destination, you know. And if you reach destinations along the way, that's fantastic. You celebrate them. Mm. But you know, going back, and this is this is me being an amazing uh, podcast. I'm going to segue right back in. But Go for, for you guys, rehearsing and working on Tangled in Dream back yep. in that warehouse. You know that was the journey that was you guys absolutely going through the going through something that was you know not terribly glamorous you're in these conditions where you did have your space and that's quite cool but it wasn't this amazing place and it was very much mm. no frills and it was very basic but it was the journey and i'm sure i'm and i'm might be putting words in your mouth but i'm i'm sure that you look back on that time quite fondly and you have great memories of that time because that yeah. was part of the story. That was a chapter along the way. And the destination in that chapter may have been the eventual release of that album. But, you know, you guys had to go through all those steps and that was the journey along the way. Man, we went broke. We went beyond broke. And um, then we somehow got money. Then we went broke again, probably. And that, 
that whole cycle repeated itself probably 20, 30 times over. Um, there were times where at the rehe- even the rehearsal space we were rehearsing at, the guy John there was pretty um, understanding and, and you know, sometimes we owed him like, you know, two, three months in, uh, of worth of, you know, rehearsal time. Um, you know, and, that, and with that being said, though, looking back on it, it was a time of fantastic, you know, development within the band. It was a time of fantastic development for us as individuals and, and as musicians, you know what I mean? Because otherwise, if we didn't do that, if we had everything really easy um, and had everything given to us without any input or effort, then I, I don't think the band would have existed until now. Mm. You know, and, you know, back then... I suppose it was easier to put time into rehearsing and, and, you know, recording, whatever, because we were young and we didn't have families, we didn't have all those commitments because, you know, when you get married and all that, of course, the, the game play changes somewhat. Yeah. It's still it's still exciting to, to do music and all that, but, you know, when you have kids, family's first and foremost and the most important thing. So you have to practice the art of selflessness, selflessness one, uh, one, one way or the other. But with that being said... Back then, we didn't have those commitments, so it was easier for us to do it, and it was harder because we had fuck all money, but it still gave us that reality kick, and I look upon it, you know, still very fondly, man. I I still do. After all these years, I just go, yeah, I I sometimes drive past the rehearsal space in Brunswick, and I just go, yeah, that was the room. There's that fucking Ratley old garage door there. That was the place. (laughs) You know what I mean? And I still smile, man. You know, it's it's not like I'm going, oh, that was a shithole. It was a creative shithole. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> with, with inspiration of meat. Yeah, meat hook <laughs> shithole. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a grindcore death metal title, doesn't there it? Go, there, you go. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah, put, put your name against that one. <laughs> 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 so, um, so, Tangled in Dream, I, I, yeah. I mean, I think for many people, and you'll probably, I mean, I wouldn't say you're sick of hearing it, but you would hear it quite often. For a lot of people, this is like the album this is the album that many people hold close to them for me and i'm, I'm sure i've spat this in your face as i've been drunk yeah. with here and gone chris i love this album so much but it, for me it's 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 one of my all-time favorite australian metal albums it's actually probably one of my favorite albums in general it's just and it's thank a, you man and it's an album that i listened to i think when i was going through um I don't know, like a, a pretty pretty pivotal pivotal moment in my life where, you know, a lot of changes were happening and I'm trying to find my feet and see where I fit into the whole grand scheme of life. And so this, amongst other albums, was soundtracks of that time. So like at all music, mm. you go back and you listen to something that reminds you of a particular time. And, um, and that time for me, I was quite impressionable. So I'm listening to a lot of stuff and it's defining where I'm going. So um, no doubt, and I've seen people online talk about the album in, in similar ways as well um for you guys i mean when you eventually got the recordings done you put it out there because i know that things at least sort of looking at it from from a high end or from a high level looking down things seemed to to go quite well um when that album came out you got some great opportunities you went over to europe you did like and you um, did tours with gamma ray and sonata Artica. you had all this mm. great stuff what was the feeling like then? Did you guys know that you had something really amazing at that time? We were just like, well, we're happy with it. We'll just we'll, we'll throw it out there and see what happens. We had no idea what was going to happen, and that's the honest truth. What we what we were focused on, we were hoping to just grasp a little bit of attention from the European market at that stage because back then in Australia there was a lot of focus in the heavy metal scene on more the side the thrash death metal stuff which has made a really cool resurgence you know what I mean in the last probably four or five years again yeah. um, but for us it was like okay and it wasn't us snubbing our nose at the Australian scene it was more or less okay this is where our music is probably more understood, not respected, but understood because there was like some European leanings in the band. Of course, you know, I mentioned this ages ago too in an interview because it's like, you know, from European backgrounds, from migrants who had emigrated to Australia. So there was always that, you know, that, yeah, take it back to there type of thing, you know what I mean? Because there's some European influences there. Uh, we never um, expected that the album was going to be so successful and and have such a good response worldwide. We didn't even expect it to have a good response like it did in Australia. It was completely surprising. You know what I mean? Um, 
you know, for us, it was like, fuck, really? Okay, all of a sudden, there's an invite for Wacken? I, I could, really? <laughs> you, know, um, you know, and then it was like the following year, you know, we we're back over Europe again. I think in 2001, I was in Europe for four and a half months, you know, and out of that four and a half months, it was close to three months comprised of touring. Mm. Um, it, it was it was completely unexpected, um, and it sent us broke, I suppose, and beyond many times, but at the same time, too, the the opportunities and the life experiences we received as a result were fantastic. You know what I mean? I look upon those times with, with you know, with really uh, – it always puts a smile on my face, you know, because I had the opportunity and, you know, with the band, you know, here and there, we've had the opportunity to travel around the world to places in Europe, you know I mean? Countries I never dreamed of seeing, you know, people I never uh, thought I'd meet, you know, like Kai Hansen, you know, Marcus from Halloween and all that, you know, and it wasn't until probably about – Three years ago when Halloween was here, I opened up the inbox one day on my computer and there was a message from Marcus going, hey, I'm playing in Melbourne. Come down. You're on the guest <laughs> list. I'm like, that's really cool. You know what I mean? Because as a kid, I loved, like we're talking about our rock heroes and the metal heroes, whatever. As a kid, I loved Keeper of Seven Keys Part 1 and 2. You know what I mean? It, that was a huge influence on me as well. So to receive an email... Um, like that was nice and that email was as a result because we made contact many years ago you know we just like played a lot of shows together it was fantastic man I never knew that Tangled in Dream would like you know take us to all those places you know back then we were in a pretty fortunate position you know and we recorded the album and it sounded fresh at the time a lot of people like it. Myself, production wise I can't handle it but that's that's what any musician's going to tell you about their own Absolutely. stuff you know yeah. but um you know, it seems to ring a, a, a really cool vibe with a lot of people, and I never expected to to have that, like you know, inverted commas, so semi cult status that it has today. I I never pictured that. I never thought that would ever happen. It was more or less a situation that we just do what we do, and um, the album came out, and there were some opportunities that fell in our favour, and it, it was just good timing all all around. You know, we had some good management that time that was looking after us. Uh, we were with a label that was doing really good things in Europe at that time as well. And so there was interest and in it spanned from there. I think the, the, the big thing that really surprised us in 2001 when Tangle and Dream, I think it was 2000 or 2000, 2001 when Tangle and Dream was released, I can't remember now. But um, Rock Hard, I think, or Heavy, Heavy Order of Us, the, the biggest mm. of the big magazines in Germany, yeah. um, you know, and this is not putting shit on Lim, but I mean, Lim Lynch North from LMP, but you know, we, I think we cropped, cracked the top 10. We made number eight. And Rhapsody at that stage of released a new album. They made my, my number 27. And <laughs> he begrudgingly sent us a quiet, you know, oh, congratulations. It was like, oh, fuck it, yes. <laughs> but that was back then when we were young. It was nice to be acknowledged in that sense. But it was nice to, you know, travel all these countries and make good contacts and, you know, people that I'm still friends with after nearly 20 years. You know, it's good. Well, I remember one thing, and this is going back a few years, but it might have been a couple of years after the album was released. I mean, Sonata Rada could cover one of your songs. Yep, Two Minds, One Soul, man. Yeah. yeah, and I remember seeing that and going, that's an indication of what sort of impact you guys have, have had and are having on people. Like, you know, for a band that, and I think even at that, that time, they were starting to really get some traction and do great things, and for them to sort of yep. tip the hat and go, these guys from Australia are amazing, and we're actually going to put the effort in to cover one of their songs because they obviously like it that much. And I know that you guys have toured with them a couple of times as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, that, that's a pretty incredible thing. I mean, that's even for me, I'm like, oh, man, like someone's got to cover a Lord song. Oh, I've, I've got to find somebody. <laughs> I've got to, I've got to, maybe I've got to throw some money at somebody and say, can you do us do it and just say that you, you actually were inspired and you really just wanted to do it, not because I paid you? <laughs> well, just for the record, we didn't pay him any money. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, with that being said, it was actually – that, that whole thing um, was really interesting. Tony, um, I think, was um, Tony Kako, the singer from Sonata Artica, and myself. We've been friends for many years. And normally when we talk, we don't talk about music. We talk about family and what have we been up to and how's life going in general. You know? And uh, he sent me a message one day and he goes, bro, listen, got an idea. And we want to cover one of your songs. Um, do you mind if we do a, a cover of one of your Vanishing Point songs? You know what I mean? I'm like... I sent a reply, yeah, go for it. And within half an hour, I sent a reply. He goes, that's good, because we already recorded it. <laughs> <laughs> and it ended up being Two Minds, One Soul, which ended up being on the Don't Say A Word CD single for Sana Artica, which yeah. went to number one in Finland at that time. Um, so that was really cool. I mean, we, we got some more fans from that as well, you know, and people that, you know, hadn't heard of us. Um, 
And that was really nice. And uh, we've, we've toured with Sonata Arctica, including the Australian tour. We've toured with them three times now. Mm. So, you know, whenever we go on tour with them, it's not like, oh, we're a band going on tour. It's more like we're catching up with a whole lot of buds and plants and geeks, you know. What I mean? yeah. <laughs> That's all it is, you know. It's cool. It's cool. And I think I just remember at the time seeing it and just going, oh, I, can't, I can't even commute, uh, compute this. This is incredible. Like, you know, me still trying to work out, you know, the the scene here in Australia and the history and, and what bands are doing what. And I think at that time, there wasn't a lot of bands that were doing a lot like overseas. There was, there was a few, but not, not like it is now where so many bands are doing great stuff. So it was, mm. um, it was incredible to be able to to see a moment like that where it's like yeah somebody somebody that even for me I was I mean I looked up to that band and just loved what they did and then just got totally surprised and went whoa what do you mean like an Australian band like Vanishing Point like you guys or what and this thing dude we were, so we, cool. were <laughs> we were just as blown away we were just as blown away you know um, it was like oh shit really okay no worries and you know but it, it was good fun so the next big thing is and you know. You guys did a lot around that time over sort of a two, three year period um, when that album came out. You know, a lot of opportunities and great things Mm. that you did touring and these, you know, these landmark, you know, festivals and playing with these amazing bands. And um, I think around 2003 or 2004, you guys started to have some label changes. You guys started to make some some changes. And then obviously that sort of fed into the next album which eventually came i think that was uh was that embrace the silence that was a bit yeah 2005 embrace the silence came out yeah Yeah. so so, with you guys i guess the question around that is you know i mean we've been through this from from our history as well um you know what something like that do to momentum for the band and what did you guys have to do and i mean you don't have to go into details because some of this sort of stuff and i know from our experiences you kind of well it's better to leave that stuff in the past. But I guess just from a a general point of view, I mean, what sort of things did you guys have to go through as far as pivots and and changes to try and just, I guess, keep moving? Man, I'll tell you honestly, it fucking kills momentum. It it, it destroys you um, for that time. Uh, It's really hard. You, You... you know, like, like I'm talk- I was talking about, you know, balance and trying to, you know, preserve energy and, you know, and recoup plus energy. And it, it took a long time to get back to how we were when Rimbrose of Science was released. With that being said, we took, oh, geez, we were rehearsing for a good solid three and a half, four years before Rimbrose of Science came out. Mm. Uh, we were going through legal loopholes the whole lot spending money that we didn't have. We came back from the tour in 2001 completely broke. Uh, we owed money to the Australian Arts Council. Um, we had loans. We had to survive. Um, uh, at that time, I'm not going to go into into this thing, but we also fired our management at that stage as well. That took a massive toll on us, you know what I mean? Because all of a sudden it's like, okay, you know, when you were talking about DIY, we had to do DIY ourselves. And we were completely green behind the ears that because we were used to a manager taking a cut and doing things for us to a degree in terms of all the business aspects, which looking upon in retrospect, hey, we were in a fortunate position back then, but also it was really silly of us to let things, you know, um, go so far that way because we should have had a hold on things. We should have had a firmer understanding on things like, you know, there was unofficial word of mouth deals, you know, signed here and there, whatever, that, you know, up until just recently, I didn't know that a certain label was still receiving publishing income from, from certain songs, um, <laughs> you know, and I was like, what the fuck is this? You That's, know what I mean? That and, sounds familiar. I think we uh, we had some yeah. conversations the other day as well about uh, mm. we could be on the same page. Anyway, yeah, sorry, continue. <laughs> yeah, so it, it, it was hard, you know, and... And it was really soul destroying. You yeah, know, what I mean, a, yeah. a lot of people, like you know, thought that Banishing Point was just riding high and making money and all that type of stuff. But we were making nothing. You know what I mean? And we were just we went back into rehearsal mode and rehearsed <clears throat> and wrote the album Embrace the Silence in a band setting. And that came out in 2005. That came out through a label called um, uh, Dockyard One Records, which was from Hamburg. Mm. Um, And it it was received really well, but at the same time, too, there was some scarring by that stage as well. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, I think, I mean, no doubt for you guys having, going from like almost what it would feel like zero to 100 with with the previous release and getting all these great opportunities and having this exposure in Europe and having this momentum Mm. and then having to then have all these distractions which take you away from mm. you know 
continuing that that train and keeping the momentum going and so yeah. it, it definitely sort of takes it throws you down a few pegs you gotta you gotta try and get yourself back up to something that's uh that's at a similar speed to where you were traveling before yeah well i mean it you know it wasn't without its casualties because by that stage joe del Mastro, the bass player you know he said look i can't do this anymore guys you know what i mean i've you know i'm buying a house whatever and i just can't afford this anymore yeah <laughs> um you know and we went from you know, he wrote a zero, more or less, you know what I mean? And it was, it really took its toll. There was a lot of infighting from time to time as well, and that reflected probably on the Embrace of Silence album as well. Um, and there was a little bit more aggression on the Embrace of Silence album in comparison to Tangled in Dream, which is a little bit more subdued in mm. comparison. That reflected probably about how we felt. But it, it was, it was a fucking prick of a time. It really was, you know. We had no money, you know what I mean? And yet we still had this hope of, doing something with the music and thankfully we, we we're still doing it but it wasn't without its casualties and it wasn't without its pitfalls you know what i mean and it's like understand how the you you have a quick um a course in understanding how the business can be really shrewd and terrible <laughs> in, in, in the same token you know it makes you wise up very quickly a, a big a big reality check oh dude like you wouldn't believe yeah. um a really big it's it's like being hit in the face with a bulldozer um, full of reality and just going, wow, okay, uh, how do I take this on? How do I just even navigate around this? And, you know, when you're bogged down with a lot of, like, you know, shit that's going on, you know, th th there's no doubt, you know, in that time, we were questioning, do we keep on going with this? You know, we, we nearly we nearly split up, you know, we, and we nearly split up even just before two th um, Distance of the Sun as well because we had, like, a massive exodus of guys who just couldn't do it anymore, mm. you know, and it does take its toll, you know. It's, it's – that was hard, man. That was hard coming back from Europe, you know, and having all those awesome experiences and then in 2002 to 2004 more or less those were the real dark years for vp really mm, dark yeah um and even i was going to touch on this later but um you know keeping keeping up with all the band member changes and i know you've you've had to deal with quite a bit of this over the years um yeah. and we've we've certainly we've had our fair share oh we've had our bitches yeah absolutely <laughs> <laughs> but um you know how how have you guys i mean you and you and silvio are probably more specifically because you guys have been there you know pretty much since day dot for the most part um you know how have you guys kept your head above water and just sort of kept you know the the vision there and and just thought you know what like you know no matter what we've we've got this thing and this is what's going to keep going and then we'll just we'll just keep pushing forward and just try and find the right people to surround ourselves with well we're lucky that you know back in 2010 so like going off tangent a bit um when some of the guys had left the band it wasn't acrimonious but it, it, it was a bit of a blow you know um thankfully we had some you know, we had some newer musicians and you know some of them didn't work out and then adrian rejoined the band the bass player rejoined the band mm. back in 2015 it was great to have that some of that former energy back. Um, but Silvio and I, you know, we're, we're still doing this after so many years. Look, you know, Silvio and I have our days too. We don't see eye to eye on things. You know what I mean? There's not going to be any band out there that will tell you that, oh, man, we all get along. It's a fucking happy family. You know, we get together for barbecues and beers all the time. Utter bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> you know? it, it does not happen that much you know because you know as i said you've got family commitments and stuff like that too and and you know at the moment it's hard to get sylvia to, to find time for the recording as well because he's really busy with his business and he's got a lot of things happening in his personal life as well which he has to attend to so the, re the recording that we're recording at the moment is, is taken not a back seat but it's slowed down a bit you know what i mean and that's frustrating for me because I've already read, pretty much written up the follow-up for the next album, that's, which is yet to be released. You know what I mean? So that's how I focus my energy, just to keep on being productive. But I'm thankful for the fact that, you know, with the lineup changes we've had and the people we've had in the band in the past, some of them have been great. Some of them have been absolute arseholes. I'm not going to bullshit. Um, but it is what it is. You know what I mean? I'm thankful that with some of the guys, especially the guys from the Tangled in Dream era, you know what I mean? We're still in touch. You know, we still say good day from time to time. And when we had the Distance of the Sun album launch, it was nice to see some of those former members even just turn up to the album launch. You know what I mean? It was great. It was like, hey, dudes, the beer's in the rider. Have a beer. Let's have a beer. You know? And it was, that was nice. You know what I mean? Because those same guys, we went through the whole shitstorm of what was you know the dealings with labels and all that type of stuff way back then you know what i mean we we had all weathered that 
those little personal tragedies together. You know what I mean? So it's good to still be in touch with them and seeing how they're going and all that. You know, it's, it's, being in a band is like being in a marriage. You know what I mean? Like, you know, I know Sylvie inside out. He knows me inside out. We know how to push each other. We know when to hold off. <laughs> we know what triggers each other off. You know what I mean? I'm thankful that I've, I've still got a vocalist who, who enjoys the music and a, a vocalist who's got a great voice. Um, but sometimes, you know, I wish that I could push Silvio a little bit further further as well, you know what I mean? But he's got his comfort zone as well, and I respect that. As, as frustrating as it is sometimes, it's just one of them things I just have to accept, and that, that's that's what it is, you know? But it was uh, back, back going back to the 2000s, um, that time, it, it was a hard time, man. It really was. I think um, I think no matter... No matter what contribution people have made along the way, whether it's been good or bad, they've been part of that that story. They've been absolutely. They've been part. They've been a chapter. They've been a section of a chapter along, you know, the the story of of in your case, Vanishing Point, or in the case of any band, you know, for us having mm. fifty million people that have come in and out of the band over the years, you know, they regardless of whether we look back fondly on certain people or not, they've made up part of that story, and and we are in our current form as it stands now doing what we're doing as a result of all those previous experiences good and bad you know we've, we've been shaped into who we are now and you take everything you know it's hindsight's Absolutely. a great hindsight's a great thing because you can you can be reflective and be a little bit more optimistic about things but um but yeah it's um it's it's a way to sort of at least from our end to process you know all of these changes that happen and those conversations that pop up where somebody where you think things are pretty stable and then someone just turns around and says yeah i've i've got to get out i've got to bail guys and you're like oh shit all right we're, we're it just, happens we're just getting momentum here you're like come on like so but you know it's it, it happens it yep. is what it is it is what it is <laughs> It happens. I mean, my whole thing, even just going back to 2016, was as soon as we did Prog Power in Atlanta in America, like I came back and within two weeks I was recording rhythm guitars. And for me, I'm old school in the sense that I'd rather get an album done within three months and it's fresh in my mind and fucking get out there and just do it. You know what I mean? And it's been a long time in between, you know, breaks here and there of recording the studio, which which is something that I can't, I can't just, you know, talk further on but it, it, it's frustrating because that's the way that i am as a person I, I like to strike it hot i like to keep momentum going and just get going you know i'm the type of guy that wants to play gigs i'll play in any shit hole that's why um but i have to take into account with other members that sometimes i don't have the time or you know uh, a family or etc whatever restricts them from doing so much as what i can do you know i'm lucky in the situation too you know that my wife simone's very understanding with what i do she takes care of the merch sales at the same time we've got twins thomas and me they know that once they go to bed hey you know if everything's clear up in the house dad's going to go and write music in his front studio i'm lucky you know i i i count my lucky stars every day that i'm in the situation where um i'm able to do this but I understand at the same time too, not every band is in that, not every person is in that situation where they can just retreat and create. You know what I mean? Um, I'm also the understanding that not everybody's got an ideal situation within their personal lives, whatever. And I have to take that into account as well. You know, you're going to have any musician out there who's going to say to you, "Look, I, I create music, or I play music, or I play live, whatever." But at the same time too, I've got a family to you know support as well and it's it's hard you know what i mean and like we we're touching upon before you know coming all the way from australia and you know you, you get an offer to tour europe or you get offered to play a festival in europe and they can only pay you like say like four or five thousand euros and you go okay well that sounds fantastic but then by the time you factor in flight tickets you factor in time away from work visas and all that type of stuff and if you're taking gear over there carnet forms if you're taking gear whatever it's a costly process, you know what I mean? It's, um, you know, if you're a band situated in Europe, it's probably a little bit easier because, you know, you can tour around Europe or whatever. It's like going, like we have from Melbourne to Sydney, you know, it's like one straight run. But in Europe, you could have like 10 dates in, in the middle of that space. Absolutely. You know what I mean? So it's it's hard. But with that being said, I'm probably going on a bit of a tangent. With Silver and I, we still just keep on doing what we do. You know, the vision is, it's, it's like an old gentleman's club. You know, we enjoy creating the stuff with the vanishing point and we enjoy playing the songs and we're fortunate in the position that when we play shows that there's people who still enjoy you know hearing the songs live 
that's what it's all about for us, man. You know what I mean? There, there's, it's never been about money or anything like that because, yeah, we've, we've made some good money in the past and we've lost a shitload of money in the past as well. Um, you know, take the good with the bad, man. That's what it is. Do you think that over the years, I mean, you probably just alluded to this, but the priorities and the way that you guys, like and especially the two of you, the way that you view the band has obviously changed and evolved over the years as, you know, life events change, you know, uh, you know, mm. as you said before, like you know, years and years ago, you guys didn't have the commitments of family and, and all, and, you know, some, in some cases career and, and all these other things. And so mm. you, you're able to put a lot more into it and you had different expectations. And as it stands now, your priorities as, as to what you want out of this band and out of this music I'm assuming would be very different to what it probably was 15, 20 years ago. Man, I would love to tour more than anything. I would love to tour more and more, but I know that I've got a family back home that I have to support. Um, I, I understand that I have a wife that wants a husband home, and the, you know, I understand I've got kids that want their father home as well. I'm lucky that from time to time I'm allowed to do that. You know what I mean? But the whole thing of me going or Vanishing Point going over, over to Europe for a six-week tour, <clears throat> that's that's not going to happen. You know what I mean? And it, it just – it happens when you get in that like, stage in life, you know, when you've got commitments and, you know, when you're married and stuff like that and you've got children. You know, you can't just go, yeah, I'm up and going like it was many years ago. Um, with the people who go on tour these days, whatever, and they're going for long periods of time, you know, from Australia, look – yeah, maybe sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm quietly envious of them. But at the same time, too, I just go, shit, I hope they're going to be all right. I think I hope they're going to be around for the long run because that takes its toll. There's no doubt about it. You know, behind any musician from Australia that gets a chance to go over Europe or whatever, there's the whole reality of coming back home and just going, shit, I've got all these bills. How am I going to pay them? You know what I mean? I've, I've got to put food on the table. How am I going to pay for that? <laughs> that all comes into play. So I think naturally over time that, yeah, priorities do shift. Um, I'd like to be more productive in terms of the regular, regularity of Vanishing Point releasing material. I, I would love to release an album every two years. I'm capable of providing that. But unfortunately, reality is preventing me from releasing them every two years. You know what I mean? Uh, it, it's, it's just the, the it's just the, the, the way things are, um, and that in effect took a long time for me to understand that too, Andy. You know what I mean? It, it, that took a lot of realization that hey, this is what it is. This is now the next chapter in your life. You're fortunate enough that you know you, you're able to play music and do what you do. But there are these added things now like kids and bills and mortgages and, and, and you know, a marriage to take care of as well, you know, a, a union with a partner to take care of. These things, you know, are, are the most important things, especially when you have kids, man. You know, your needs don't come first. It's the kids' needs. Yeah. Oh. You know, and, you know, look, I was lucky going back. I'll, I'll tell you a quick story, man. Basically, I did the Dragon Force tour in 2007 with Vanishing Point. We did... Um, we did Australia, we did, I think, uh, Brisbane, Sydney, Adelaide, Melbourne, two shows, Canberra, and then we shot off to Auckland and New Zealand. My wife was pregnant with my twins, Thomas, Mia and Thomas, So, um, uh, and she was heavily pregnant. You know, it was getting to a point where, you know, hey, I wasn't sure if I was going to do the tour. My wife said, go and do the tour. But when you come back, once the kids come in the world, mate, you're taking three months off. Easy. Not a problem. So, you know, there I was, you know, did the tour, came back to work. I was at work for four days on night shift. All of a sudden, bang, the kids came in the world. Hmm. You know what I mean? It's like that was a big reality hit. You know what I mean? They're talking about, you know, people who they get depressed when they become family sometimes. That happened to me big time because it's like, wow, it took me a lot to understand and accept that my needs are not important as much as the kids. My family comes number one. And I was lucky that in 2008, when we did this tour, uh, tour with Sonata Antica, that was a six and a half week tour. I was lucky to do that tour. My wife said, go and do it. And my kids had just turned one. I left my wife at home with twins, you know what I mean, who were, who were still babies, you know. And I'll never forget when I was on the bus from France to Spain and um, I got a message from my wife, a text message on my little old Nokia phone saying, I know you're having fun on the tour. I know you miss us. 
but we just wish you were here. Um, both the kids have got croup and they're not feeling the best. And, you know, it's it's a little bit tiring. And I was just like, oh. oh yeah. I was going to say, how the, Dude, how the you know what I mean? Up. Fuck, man. I was in tears. You know what I mean? I, was, I, I just wanted to get on the first plane and go home. Mm. You know, I really did. You know, I wanted to get on the first plane to go home, you know, but I couldn't because I had committed myself to doing that tour you know what i mean and I, look don't get me wrong I, I i was wrapped to doing that tour and i, and I love that tour. i love the the camaraderie there were some hard times on that tour, tour as well but it was good fun but when i got home my wife saw me at the airport picked me up and i was happy and i was fortunate that i got to the airport and my wife and my kids was waiting there hmm. there is always the stories about all the bands that you hear about the guys who are touring and all that type of stuff they come home and there's nobody to pick him up. There's a fucking taxi waiting to pick him up. That's it. Mm. That's the reality. And that is the cold, hard reality. So all I could say to people in the future is, you know, if you get an opportunity to tour, by all means do it. You know what I mean? If you can do it. But at the same time, too, I would say to the fans as well, if you get an opportunity to support a band, support the band as much as you can because these are the realities that happen to musicians when they come home. You know what I mean? They come home and, and, and nine times out of ten, they haven't got $2 in their pocket. They've got enough money probably just to play, catch a taxi home, whatever. They get home to an empty house, whatever. There's dust all over the place and they've got to restart again. <laughs> you know, it's it's harsh. You guys have been there. We've been through it as well. You know, um, tour blues happen to a lot of musicians. You know what I mean? It's a fact. It's hard. And um, I think, I mean, you guys have done a good job of this is that even though you might – sort of not disappear but you sort of go away from from the public eye for a little bit mm. um vanishing point exists it it is a band it's not a band that mm. has ended and no longer exists anymore like people would still refer to you guys as a band and mm. when time moves on and people look back yeah okay people that actually saw you on particular tours will remember those things but mm. people won't know or won't remember those lulls those times where you guys had to really sort of work yourselves out and 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 even from your personal point of view the frustration of not being able to get something out quick enough and and, yeah. and keeping that productivity and that flow moving people will not not know those things or not rem remember those things they'll just see vanishing point a band that's been around for 20 25 years and has done yeah. all this and released all these albums and has this music and as we know music's timeless and yeah. so all the things along the way and they and some bands are really good at this they, they create that as part of their story and that becomes yeah. more of a, a thing that people can identify with but um, I think sometimes we get swept up in the crisis that's happening at that point in time and then we realize that in the end we're we're in this for life like we love doing what we do and mm. and i'm sure for for you and silvio the the name of that band is just it's it's part of your identity it's who who you guys are so no matter what happens and if it takes you another however many years to get another album out it, it doesn't matter because vanishing points its own thing it, it's it's existing it's breathing even though it might not be breathing as quickly as you as you <laughs> hope at times but but it's people forget those things and and time time has a way of rewarding um those that uh, are in it for the long haul instead of just worrying for a, you know a short-term win and trying to get the next opportunity and chasing chasing their tail look it's sometimes like this andy and this is the reality of it when vanishing point is sleeping because we're all a little bit older when vanishing point is sleeping it's like it's sleeping with a cpap machine on <laughs> <laughs> but with that being said look honestly I think that, you know, look, so far we've been lucky in the sense that, you know, we still have people who enjoy what we do. You know what I mean? Um, first and foremost, irrespective of all the shit that we've been through and we've had some success as well, first and foremost, and as much as it sounds really cliched and really cheesy and wanky, we absolutely embrace and we are so grateful for the support we've received, we've received from, you know, labels, but most importantly, the fans, the people that, you know, send us messages and, and buy our music and come to our shows. Man, that to us is what it's all about. You know what I mean? Nikki Six from Motley Crue had this saying many years ago, and it pretty much sticks to me today as well. When I'm playing a show, when we're playing a show, and if I see somebody in the crowd who's singing the words to a song that we've written, it doesn't get any better than that. Yeah, it just doesn't, you know what I mean? And I even saw it for you guys when we were at Prog Power. You know, I remember standing out and that's on, 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 the, on the floor there watching you guys playing. 
And I was so proud of you guys. I was like fucking grinning from ear to ear, but I was watching the people around me. And they're singing the lyrics back to you guys of the songs you wrote. And that's what we received as well. And that, to me, is the ultimate reward. You know what I mean? It, money doesn't come into it. You know what I mean? The hardship doesn't come into it. When you see somebody singing back your craft, singing back the lyrics that you've written for something that meant so, means so much to you, that is as worth, worth its weight in gold. You know what I mean? And it is, it's golden, man. You know what I mean? Like, you know, pretty much out the Australian middle bands who have been doing it for a long time now, it's yourselves within the site, the melodic, like progressives, like, you know, uh, melodic metal type of vibe that we're doing. It's Lord slash Dungeon, Vanishing Point, and there's Black Majesty, there's I Fear, you know what I mean? Man, we, we're all still doing it. We're doing it in a limited capacity to a degree, but we're all still doing it, you know what I mean? And I'm sure that if somebody asked Tim this same question, you know, what do you get out of it? And Tim would probably say the same thing, you know what I mean? If somebody's, you know, get into the songs and sing the lyrics back to us, that's a good thing, you know? Well, and, I, remember, oh, I, I remember standing. I'm, I'm, I, I, I say it and sound nostalgic, you know. I mean, no, it sounds I, like uh, not emotional, but it's like really nostalgic about it. But that's the fact. But you know what I mean. Is. And I had the same feeling. Like I mean, I think it was talk of uh, of prog power that year when we both played, where yeah. were, so many people were in the crowd watching you guys play, and the grin that you had on stage, everyone everyone felt it, and everyone just went, "Yeah, no, this is cool," because you. You were you were showing everyone how you're feeling, and it was yeah. exactly the way that you just described it, and it's the way that many of us feel. And suddenly, so many people could identify with it, and it was just like, yeah, this is this is a moment, and there's a lot of moments that happen, and we all have our mm. own moments. And you guys, and you in particular, was were having a moment at that at that point in time. And and same thing, yeah, Thanks, I was bro. looking around the, the crowd, and people were singing your songs, and people were freaking out. And and knowing that you know we were in the same position as you guys, like we hadn't been there, you know. And you was- guys slayed, man. You guys slayed. <laughs> I was standing there watching you guys. I was just going fuck. You know what I mean? Like, and, and I'm thinking like, because Jim and I have always had this quiet little rivalry. You know what I mean? Type of yeah. thing over the years. And I'm thinking like, how the fuck am I going to beat this? <laughs> <laughs> you know, because you guys just got up there and pow, fuck, there was no high. We're Lord. We're, it was bang. We've come to take you and grab you by the fucking throat. And you're gonna love it. <laughs> and let's <laughs> let's get together. Let's party. And I was standing there, man. I was standing standing in front of Mark Mark, Mark Furtner, and I was just I was grinning from ear to ear. And I was like, "This is awesome." And for me, also, you know, coming from Australia, you know, from us both bands coming from Australia, I was so proud and so happy to be part of that experience. Likewise, you know. Yeah. And for us, it, it, when we played Plug Power as well, I couldn't help but feel this positive yet emotional release on stage because. <clears throat> Uh, by that stage, like I felt like I was playing to uh, a, a room full of friends and fans who had known the band for nearly 20 years, who had, would all be in touch with each other also through various times via email. You know, um, there was radio people there that I'd been in touch with since 2001, 2002, and vice versa. And it was so, I'm not going to say the term joyous, but it was so... It's such an awesome release to play with all these people and go, hey, this is what we do. And to get that vibe, get that emotion, get that energy back to them, yeah, I'm, I'm the first one to admit, man, I cried on stage. I felt it, you know what I mean? And people felt that as well. And, you know, I look, bon- I look back at Prog Power with, with so many fond memories, man. I, I miss the people there. I miss the whole... That that whole weekend was just phenomenal. <laughs> it was great. We, we might have <laughs> many to... beers were consumed as well, oh, but it was just yeah. fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I think we might have to try and ask uh, ask for some uh, some generous leave from our prospective partners, and we might have to travel back over there and uh, and try. Oh, that would be amazing. Yeah. Oh. That would be amazing. It really would, you know. And I mean, <clears throat> look, we we spoke to the the, the the head guy Glenn, you know, yep. about you know about the possibility of coming back over in the future, and he goes, well. Just get the album out and we'll talk then, you know. Yeah. So there's always that open door. So we'd love to be back there, you know what I mean? And it'd be awesome, you know, for us both bands to travel back there again and, you know, relive that fantastic weekend. You know, it was great. The great experience, great people, great organisation, just great fans and great atmosphere, man. It was just, it was so positive, it was overwhelming. Yeah, <laughs> you absolutely. Know? Is it a unique, it great. It's a unique place and, I mean, they've, it's taken them taken them years to build build what it is, but um, I'm, yeah, I'm I'm very similar to what to to your look on it, where it's just it's it's such a 
it's such a, a weird and wonderful place in the sense that there's this nothing like it in the world, you know. And Wacken's got their own vibe, but Wacken's seventy mm. odd thousand people. Um, That's right. And what Prog Power's been able to do, and with you know them not wanting to scale it, not wanting to go, well, mm. we're, we're selling this thing out, so let's go to a bigger venue. It's like, no, nah, we've we've got something good here, and and everything works, and and we know what we want and what we want out of it. And the great thing about those guys is that. I mean, like a lot of organisers, they're music fans, but those guys are deliberately trying to pick bands that they personally love and yeah. they'll give bands a shot. And the fact that every band on that roster for the fe- for the four days of that festival got, you know, a minimum of about an hour set was incredible, mm. you know. And so it gave yeah. everyone a, a chance to shine and, and for people that travelled from, from far could could get on stage and actually have an opportunity to show what they're all about. And, and for the fans as well, that like for, for your fans, not knowing you guys and following and, and appreciating the music for so many years. And then finally, after all these years, being able to see you guys and not just see you guys for, for 15 minutes on stage and rushing off, but actually seeing yeah. a, a good show. And, and I mean, that's a, it's a pretty incredible moment. I mean, I don't, I don't often stop and and, and think about it, but um, you certainly got me thinking about it now. Where I'm like, oh wow, this. Yeah. I mean, I know that I know in theory that it was an incredible time, but I think time moves so quickly that you mm. rush and you don't really stop. And you know, the old saying, "Stop and smell the roses." But um, yeah, even just thinking about it now, it's like, yeah, you know what? That's um, I think it's gonna be one of those moments that um, is just it's it's always gonna stick, and it's gonna be something when people talk about what what were those things that you experienced that were really sort of, you know, defining moments and things that just stay in your memory. I think that's definitely gonna be one of them. Look, for us, it definitely was too, um, and there's without a doubt because look, you know. Going back to even the Tangle and Dream era, you know, when we were touring Europe and all that, there was also a lot of interest from America, North America, for us to tour there. Um, and then shit fell south for us and none of that happened, basically. Mm-hmm. So there was a lot of people that were from that time still waiting for us to come over, you know, and they'd been messaging us for years, when are you guys coming over? When are you guys coming over? What's mm-hmm. going on, you know? And eventually when we were announced, you know what I mean? Like I think Gary Carson from Screaming Symphony um, Radio here at PBS said that he was there, when you were there in 2015, he said when Vanishing Point <coughs> was announced on the, on the big screens, yeah. he said the response was just fucking insane. Yeah, it was. And I'm like really you know <laughs> wow okay this, this is cool but I, I never expected that yeah i expected there to be some fans that going yeah cool 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 and that's it you know what i mean um i didn't expect to see a standing ovation that room I, I did that in my wildest dreams i never thought that would happen um and you know i didn't expect everything to go so smoothly because you know we had some issues in before that you know with a drummer that was going to do it and then he left the band or he ended up being ejected from the band or whatever and so we had a lot of concerns you know with the whole process before that you know what i mean we were pretty much on edge but with that being said it was just such an awesome weekend um and all power and hats off to glenn and his team and milton and all the guys there for organizing it um it's just a phenomenal festival and i would say to anybody anybody listening to this podcast you know if you get a chance to once in your life go to a festival apart from the festivals in europe but if you get a chance to once in your life to go to a festival which is which is just a, a, an awesome community positive experience but an awesome community community that embraces each other go to prog power go to prog power you you, you have to <laughs> it's fantastic I can't speak highly enough of it. I'm not saying that because, hey, I want another Glenn. <laughs> Glenn, in case you're listening, it's not that at all. I'm just telling the truth. It, it's such a fantastic experience. It's an awesomely run festival. And I just can't fault it, man. I really can't. You know what I mean? One of the most welcoming groups and environments that I've ever been in. Like, as as you said before, I, was, mm. I went the year before just to just to see what it was all about and, and meet a few people and say hello and – and just walking around and, and obviously I think we sometimes have a bit of an advantage being Australian. So when you open your mouth and you start speaking, then everyone sort of turns and goes, Oh, <laughs> oh look, yeah. this, is, this is a novelty, but, um, it was cool. And it was just incredible how inviting people were. And, you know, yes. people would walk up to you and they, they're like, do you want a drink? Or they just come and just talk to you. And, and, yes. and it was just, people just had time and, 
you know, yeah. both years, like, and especially when we came back. And for me, it was really cool because I, I saw it from both sides. And, and then coming back and then seeing people and the way that they talk about each other, they talk about each other as a family. And so yes. every year, most people don't see each other through the year. They come from every corner of the United States and people from overseas as well. So it's like this yeah. reunion that happens. And they and that, they plan their vacation around Prog Power. And it's incredible. Precisely. And it's just yeah. this it's amazing vibe all all over those four or five days that um, you know, people are congregating there. And it's just, um, yeah, I um, I was very tempted to, to go back last year and I was trying to scrape some dolls together. I thought, oh, no, I'll, I'll, I'll behave. But um, I'm, I'm, it, it's infectious and I understand why people go yep. in, go year in, year out. And it's just one of those things where it's a, it's a unique little pocket in the world and um, it's it's really cool to, to be able to say that I've been a part of it. Man, and, you know, I was the same as you last year as well. You know, when Prog Power was happening, I was like, and I actually posted on Facebook, I said, look, to all my friends, I wish I was there. And one guy messaged me, he goes, you know what, quietly, quite a few of us were hoping you are going to surprise us and just turn up. And I said, man, I would have loved to, but <laughs> it's not to be. But with that being said, and I've got to say, for in, in terms of a perspective of Australian metal music and hard, hard music as it is, how fucking awesome is it to see Voyager headlining one of the nights this year? Oh, you know what I mean? Yeah. That to me, like, dude, fucking hats off to them. Seriously. I've I, I got to be honest with you. I like what they do now, but I'm more of a fan of the older stuff. But hats off to them for doing what they do and they're headlining one of the nights there. You know what I mean? Dude, <laughs> I ain't getting any better than that. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're a band that has just totally embraced the people that support them and they've they've been over the states quite a few times now and i saw yeah. them i because they played the year before they played i think this would be the third time i think or maybe the fourth i can't remember. i do believe so yeah. yeah yeah so i saw them the year before we played and i was sitting up the back in in the room and i just thought this is incredible like i'm watching the crowd yeah. and and they're just they're in love with them and and yeah but they've made such an effort to really connect with those people and treat them as friends and as they talk to each other and say we're mm. family it's a prog power family and so they've mm. they've become part of that family and they've embraced that and i think that's sort of helped them um you know really sort of establish themselves over there but of course i mean you know their their skill and their music and what they do and their hard work is paying off and that's part of the reason mm. why, they're, why they're doing what they're doing but they're just they're you know the humility that they have and the way that they connect with people is is something that definitely separates them from a lot of other bands, and I think that's uh, that's a big factor as to as to why they they get so many great opportunities on top of you know their talent as well. And look, and and, and just deserved because look, they've worked hard at it. You know what I mean? They've worked hard at they sacrifice a lot, and you know, with that being said as well, is there is no denying that a lot of kudos go to them as well for opening up the gates for bands like us. Yep. You know, and you guys for playing Prog Power in the past as well. If it wasn't for Voyager, you know what I mean, playing Prog Power initially, you know, really, uh, how many other bands would have uh, had a look in there? You know what I mean? They are the guys who did it first. And they created that awesome impression and they still have that. They attain that awesome impression with the people and the fans and the community there. And it makes it easier for bands like us to just walk on in and, and people go, hey, the Aussies are here. And, you know, the, the guys from Voyager and the guys from Vanishing Point and Lord and all that, we're all pretty much the same. We're all working our day shift jobs and all that type of stuff, day jobs as well. But when we go to places like that, it's cool to be embraced, you know what I mean? But look, honestly, all points to them, man, because without them, it would have been probably harder for other Australian bands to get a look in initially. So, 100%. Yeah, yeah agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Okay, so last thing before we wrap it up, and I'm, glad, I'm glad that I asked you about Coriander to begin with because it has made Fucking the conversation. Fucking shit it is. <laughs> Rubbish. I don't know. You, you can't even pass the shit as weed killer, mate. You, you know what, half the time, you can't even burn it with petrol. You know, it's just <laughs> fucking rubbish. <laughs> fucking rubbish. I don't understand why people put on a dinner plate. You know, I'm even stuttering with anger because I'm thinking of it. <laughs> I can't wait for those T-shirts. I cannot. I oh, cannot mate, I'm going to do them. I'm going to fucking do them. <laughs> <laughs> so the Go big, for it. What's the, the next question, the bro? Big que the big question is, and I know it's probably going to be a difficult one because it's been going for a while now, but... Um, where where are you at with the new album? Are you looking to get it out this year? Is it on is it on track? I know that you know obviously things things uh, move differently these days as you've as, as we've discussed earlier. But um, mm. where, where's it currently sitting at the moment? Okay, so currently it's sitting that we're four songs in with vocals, um, and basically Dean's got his Terra Maze album is doing as well. So he's got a fine time between the two. 
it's how can I say? Look, it's frustrating. Mm. It really is because there were a whole lot of factors um, uh, involved that that's like you know made the album um, become majorly delayed. I'm so like you know sitting here going fuck you know when am I going to get the email from a record label saying when the fuck is this album coming out? I get emails and messages from people a lot saying when's the album coming out? When's the album coming out? Uh, it frustrates me because I can't give them the correct answer. <clears throat> mm. um, it, it really it fucking hurts, man. Because I, I, you know I get messages. I see other bands doing stuff on Facebook. I'm just like, man, we we should be doing stuff too. You know what I mean? But I understand that we're in a position at the moment where we can't. Um, Maybe it's a little bit of ADHD in me, who knows, but sometimes it gives me the shits <laughs> um, greatly and therefore I'm just making myself my third or fourth coffee for today and having the fifth cigarette, whatever, just going fuck. So I, I write music as a result to try to offset those negative emotions. But it is hard to control them sometimes. But that being said, the album is pretty much done, just apart from the vocals, and then it's got to be mixed. I'm in the middle of doing orchestration for it. I'm virtually completed the orchestration, but it's hard to organise everybody's timeline to get it going. I'm pushing now for a schedule to be um, started so that there is work always done every week. There has to be. I'm pretty strict on keeping to a timeline. Mm. Unfortunately, that timeline is blown out. Um and I'm not going to sit there and say, hey, it's, it's not my fault because it's not fair because it's, it's, it's the whole band's fault. But at the same time, too, there's been some other issues involved as mm -hmm. well. The songs are there. Um, and they sound great. Um, I've put a lot of work and effort and time into it. So have the guys. And it's frustrating for us. But I, I suppose that most of you guys know who, who are Facebook friends with, my, with me on Facebook. You know, they see that I seldom post anything vanishing point for the time being because otherwise I get bombarded. <laughs> um, you know, because I don't want to stir up anything, but at the same time too, it's getting to a point where it's like, fuck, it has to be done, but I have to understand other people's um, circumstances. With that being said, and going down the cheesy route, I think that the people are going to really enjoy the next album. Um, there's some ups and downs in the album, but um, it's just a good, strong album. There's some progressive elements. There's some fast elements. There's some heavy elements. There's even some AOR hard rock elements in there. Beautiful. Um, you know, which, which for me, I wanted to do for a long time, you know what I mean? And just maybe it wasn't a conscious effort, but I started coming up with some AOR type of stuff, which is adult orientated rock for the listeners out there who are not sure what the term of the label is. Yeah. Um, I wanted to it's like recapture not subconsciously, but, you know, I mean, just, just not, sorry, not consciously, but subconsciously captures some of the elements of what was on Tangled in Dreams in terms of just the, the song feel, you know what I mean? And I come up with some songs um, and they feel like a little bit of, you know, something's taken out of the Tangled in Dream rule book to a degree. At the same time, too, there's a lot of stuff that sounds like the stuff that's on Distance of the Sun as well. It's still just vanishing point. There's no great progression or great change or anything like that. It's still what people expect from Vanishing Point. It's melodic. Silvio's vocals are shining, whatever. You know, I've taken a back seat now with my guitar playing. I'm playing more rhythm, doing some leads, but doing what I do, just doing scrap metal, man, and getting older, fucking, I can't play leads like I used to, so I get James to do that. Um, but the songs are sounding really good. Um, they're sounding tight, and I just, you know, I hope that people enjoy it when it comes out, you know. I mean, at the end of the day, for me, it's more or less like, you know, if people like it, great. If they don't, hey, that's okay too, but I enjoy, it's sounding selfish, but I still enjoy playing it, you know what I mean? And if people enjoy that at the end of the day, then that's a bonus, you know what I mean? There's nothing more I want in life musically. It's the next chapter. It's the next chapter, man. It's the next chapter, you know what I mean? And already after this chapter, there's like pretty much three quarters of the next album's already written as well, you know what I mean? It's... That's the way that I do things, you know what I mean? I've, I've never been one to just go, okay, I'm going to get into a writing phase. No, I'll fucking just capture it whenever i got the inspiration. And I'm fortunate and lucky that I've got the facility at home which I can do that and get demos up to really good standard, um, pre-production standard, and then present it to the guys and say, okay, what do you guys think? And, uh, and I'm also fortunate and grateful that I've got guys who enjoy it. And I'm, I'm also got fortunate and grateful that I've got guys this time also who are contributing a little bit more as well, which is nice. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, I feel you. Um, it's been, I don't know how many years for us, 
five many five years actually uh it was five years the other day since the last studio album came out so yeah we're um we will we will have something out hopefully by the end of the year at some stage but um we're in the same position you know you don't want to talk about things too much because then it opens up that dialogue with people going well when's it mm. going to happen and then you think it's going to happen soon and then it doesn't quite happen and we're in the same position we're we're relying on each other and yes and everyone's got their own thing their own yeah. story their own priorities and you've got, just got to find compromise and it can be uh you can you can be pulling hair out or trying to get blood out of a stone sometimes but um in the end however long it takes it eventually does happen and um and yeah when it does happen it's 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 pretty sweet so it's just um it's just holding on until <laughs> until it happens but it'll be good when uh be good when we both got some albums out we might have to play some shows absolutely i think that'd be great andy to, to play some shows together and do some touring together i think that actually that's something that um in australia that um a lot of people probably wanted you know both the bands to do as well so we should definitely tee something up like that um, with that being said, too, look, I completely understand where you guys are coming from. You know, it's, we, we just at that age now where, you know, we've always, always got our priorities and sometimes the priorities shift, but it, it does get frustrating at the same time, too. We just got to keep on doing what we do because I look upon the end, at the end, at the end of the day and I just go, well, I could easily just as fucking uh, just throw it all in. You know what I mean? Just go, you know what? It's too hard. I've had enough. Easily throw it in. But then I know what I'm like that within two weeks to maybe a month or so, I'd be itching to play more music. You know, no, I, I don't think a lot of people understand that when you're a musician, whatever, it's it's a creative addiction. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and, and you just, when you've got that creative addiction and it just itches at you, you just want to keep on going just to, to, to quell that itch more or less, you know what I mean? And the benefits are that, you know, from quelling that itch and, you know, and serving what you want to do, creatively speaking, the benefits are that people enjoy what you do, you know? And I can see it from the outset, set, I can say from the outset too, with what you guys do and, you know, knowing Tim for so many years, LT for so many years, I'm so wrapped that you guys are still going as well. You know, it is a hard road. It is a hard slog at times. You know what I mean? It's 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 hard, but it's so good to see so many Australian bands still going strong after all them years, and it's so good to see the newer generation of Australian bands going strong as well. There, there's some incredible talent out there. You know what I mean? Sometimes it's hard to sit there and 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 see that and be happy for bands, whatever. When you just go fuck, you know what I mean? My stuff's sitting there on the back burner, but. It is still comforting to see that there is a newer generation of bands, you know, coming out with really good stuff. And it's nice from time to time to get compliments from them as well when they go, hey, man, you know, I love Tangled in Dream or Distance of Sun, I love that, or Embrace the Silence, you know, really got me out of the doldrums at a certain part of my life. And, and next thing you, you see this musician, they're just fucking bigger than Ben Hur, man. That, that's <laughs> awesome. Yeah, that's good, you know what I mean? It shows our age and to a degree, but who cares? You know what I mean? It's, it's nice to still be around and doing this. Absolutely. And, you know? and going back to what you said about what Voyager did, for us, you know, with Prog Power mm. and opening some some doors up and, and awareness to what's happening here and making it easier for us to be able to almost just walk into this great scenario. Um, yes. You know, a, lot of, a lot of bands that are doing amazing things now and going off on these gigantic North American and European tours and touring through Asia, I mean, they're they're out there telling the story of what Australian music's all about. And people yep. will then dig deeper. And then as a result, they, they find all the other bands that are still existing and still playing. And, and yeah, we might not be playing as much, but it still comes back for us and it helps us. And I think, you know, I, I'm, I'm certainly in the same boat at times. I look at, I look at mates that, you know, are a bit younger than me and they, mm. and they just announced like this amazing support tour with like this incredible, you know, amazing band all through Europe or North America. And I just go, oh, you bastards. Like, oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I, You're I, happy I, for it, but at the same time, I, I killed like, it. I killed to do it. And then, I, and, then, and then you sort of look around at, at your group and your guys and you think, and then that's when the messages, the group messages, come on, guys, like, what are we doing? What are we doing? And then but yeah. you, you sort of you get swept up in that moment. And I think when you take a step back and you realize, you know, what, like we do our thing our way and it works. Mm. And and going back to what we said earlier, 
you know, the band name is almost bigger than all of us. And, you know, Absolutely. We, can, we can slow down a little bit. You know, we can take a, a small break here and there. But in the end, the band's not ending. The band continues. Yep. The music's there. The music's timeless. People on a daily basis discover our stuff. Like, I get messages yeah. from people that just go, I just I just found you guys. Oh, my God. Like, and they're talking about a song that was written 10 years ago. And I think, oh, man, like, yeah. that's, a, that's a lifetime ago for me. Like, I... I I'm not. Even, I'm a completely different person now, and <laughs> yeah. and that's only ten years. But for others, it's you know people are discovering music from the '70s and from the '60s, and I just think that's so cool. Yeah. And and it takes the pressure off. It it's, suddenly you go, you know what? Life's good. Life's really good. Absolutely, man. Look, we live in a good country. You know, we li- we lead a pretty good life. You know what I mean? As much as we all had hardships as musicians, whatever. Life is still pretty good, man. It's it's good, you know. I mean, you know, you, you, as I said, you can take it any which way you want. You can either make it easier for yourself or hard for yourself. But life is pretty good, you know. What I mean, and as you said, I mean, look, you know, I see through your posts on Facebook and through social media, and, and also what you're doing with Andy Social as well. You're giving the opportunity for newer bands to emerge as well, and I think that's really good. You know, there's so many more avenues now for newer bands to emerge and get out there, and and you know, us old timers to hear about them as well. I think it's good that we're all still doing something. <laughs> I think it's good, you know, because there's been so many musicians in the past where, which have been excellent at their craft and they've just gone, you know what, fuck this, I can't do this anymore. And sadly, they've disappeared. You know what I mean? Some of the bands that I followed many years ago in Australia, for example, like bands like Hyperion and stuff like that and Allegiance. I mean, Allegiance yeah. is cult-like status. I mean, yeah. you know, I would love to see Allegiance tour Australia. I would love to see Hyperion play again. But sadly, is isn't so, you know what I mean? And Dave um, Harrison from Allegiance when and did Black Steel, you know, I never even got a chance to see Black Steel either, you know what I mean? I was seriously thinking, fuck, maybe later on this year I'll fly to Perth just to see Black Steel live, yeah, yeah. you know, <laughs> but it's like coming from a time, you know, when we saw so many bands years ago that we looked up to and they've completely folded, to me it's more or less in the mindset that, you know, just keep it going in whatever capacity you can, you know, do what you can within your abilities, you know, whether it's creating music, playing, whatever, or just continue on the band name, just do what you do, Hope for the best. Don't expect anything majorly to come your way or whatever. Just cruise with it and anything that comes to to you is a bonus. You know what I mean? You know, that's the way I look upon it. That's it. We can we can we can have our cake and eat it too. Oh, absolutely. Why not? <laughs> Why not? Yeah. And a couple of beers on the side too and all that. But yeah, it's look, man, life's pretty good. Yeah. Life's pretty good. Well, I think that's a great way to end this off. We started with coriander, and we ended, ended off on a, a nice God. positive, nice positive note. So there we go, We've come full circle. <laughs> <laughs> coriander and ginger beer, two number one fucking things. I never oh. understand why people like. That. <laughs> All right. Well, next time we catch up, we'll talk. About, we'll, we'll start the conversation off with some ginger beer. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck that too. No, Andy. Seriously, it's a pleasure talking to you, mate. After all this time, and 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 look, I'm really grateful to be on the podcast as well. I think it's great what you're doing. Um, thanks for taking the time out as well, man. You know, and I hope that the people who listen to this, you know, didn't cringe too much and they enjoyed the conversation. I had a bit of a laugh here or there, and maybe some people also got an insight in just into you know what was happening with the vanishing point in the past and the present. And uh, yeah, thanks for your time, man. I appreciate that. Uh, back at you. I'm sure. I'm sure a lot of people will uh, enjoy listening to this. So we'll uh, we'll see what happens. But um, yeah, thanks so much. And Cheers, bro. We'll chat soon. New album will be out this year. Done. All right, done. Got you on record. <laughs> See Cheers, <you> brother. <laughs> Bye. Bye for now. Thanks, everyone. If you want to reach out to Chris, I'm sure he would be more than happy to say hello to you guys. Um, I'm going to put all the links to Chris and Vanishing Point and everything else we discussed. Um, there's a bunch of band references that we mentioned in this chat, so I'm going to try my best to put everybody in there. If I miss somebody, let me know and I'll add it in later on. So um, please put me on call for that because there's a lot of great talent, a lot of great bands in this country in Australia. And, um, you know, we've, a lot of us have been around for quite some time, but there's many people in the world that still don't know we exist. So if I can do my thing by making sure that there's references to people, then, um, you know, that's, that's the least that I can do. So please, you know, hold me accountable if I miss a link for, for a particular band that we threw in passing there. So um, everything will be over in andysocial.net in the show notes as per every guest on the Andy Social podcast. And um, I'm sure Chris and all the guests that have been on this podcast over the last few years will be more than happy to uh, hear from you and hear 
what you thought of uh, of this episode and of obviously what they do as well. So uh, antisocial.net, go over there. Um, before we wrap it up, as always, you can support this podcast in a whole range of different ways. If you want to shout me a beer, you can go over to antisocial.net and click on the shout me a beer button. It takes you to paypal.me and the money that I get from there actually goes towards my beer. And the more money that you guys spend on my beer, it's the less of my personal money I spend on beer, which means it's more personal money that I can actually spend on this podcast. A very indirect way of supporting the Andy Social Podcast, but I love beer and I don't think I'm going to stop buying beer. So you may as well help me with my habit and shout me a beer via that function. Um, there's a whole range of other ways. Well, I've got t-shirts. I've got USB passes from the first 100 episodes of, uh, of the Andy Social Podcast. When I get to episode 200, I will more than likely do the same thing again. So help me sell out of the first batch of, of uh, USB passes so I can get ready for for 101 to 200, um, you can go over to Bandcamp. Uh, you can go via the Dominus uh, Records Bandcamp page, or you can just go through antisocial.net. It's probably easy just to go that way. And uh, you can support the podcast by doing that. But you know, you guys are listening to this and that's the support that I need. And that's what I love from uh, you guys and hearing you guys tell me about what you think of different guests and that you enjoyed the conversations. That means a hell of a lot to me. And if you can share it around, um, give me a little like or a love heart or a retweet or whatever it is, it goes a hell of a long way. And means a hell of a lot to me so thank you very much so that's it guys